humanity, a snapshot of him being a servant, a snapshot of him as Savior, a snapshot of him as teacher. And this morning, using Scripture as our lens, I will capture him, an image of him as Lord. Have you ever noticed the marketing techniques and strategies that are used today? There are a number of different tactics that are geared towards putting a a positive spin on whatever product, whatever particular product they're trying uh, to market, while also minimizing any and all of the potential drawbacks. In big, bold letters, they will uh, reveal the, uh, uh, declare to us the, 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 the wonderful, most appealing uh, qualities involving the product. Then in very, very tiny print, they will reveal the negative things that may service. Maybe it's a, a commercial, a television commercial, and, and uh, uh, visually the most inviting, most appealing scenes, the most pleasant things are played across the screen while just the right voice declares all the benefits of that particular product. But then at the closing of the commercial, while still showing the pleasantries on the screen, then you will hear a very unnoticeable voice begin to speak very, very quickly the disclaimers. You hear them at the end. And you, ne- you don't pick up on any of those things, but because they are required to do so, they, ha- they put that in the end of the commercial. And in this way, it's all orchestrated to cause us to recognize the potential benefits while also overlooking the potential problems. They're very crafty in their attempts to get us to buy their product. Uh, they know how to play on the positives and downplay the negatives. Therefore, people end up, you and I, end up purchasing products without really knowing exactly what we're getting. Well, Jesus didn't operate that way. In calling people to follow him, he wanted people to recognize everything pertaining to life with him as Lord. He didn't gloss over the negatives that may result from following him, and he didn't embellish any of the positive benefits that uh, that uh, come with following him which are many he just laid it all out there as it is and the bible tells us that in john eight thirty two, the truth shall set you free it's not just partial truth that uh, liberates us it's whole truth positive and negative and that's what jesus did he declared the positive things that would result from following him the forgiveness of sins peace with god grace and favor and mercy and and protection and provision and guidance and hope and purpose and all of those positive things. But then he also spoke of the negatives, the potential for persecution, the potential for trials and sacrifice, uh, being misunderstood and all of these things. In a sense, Jesus put warning labels on his teaching. I saw a funny warning label the other day for a broom made by the company Sabco. It had its usual bold letters that said deluxe, deluxe kitchen broom made with 100% natural fibers. Then at the bottom in small print it said not suitable for flying. (laughs) Needless to say I didn't get that one for Tricia. Really, that's, uh, that was an actual product. Jesus wants people, he wants all people to accept him and follow him as Lord. But because it's not always a bed of roses, he puts warning label after warning label on his teaching as he calls people to serve him. He doesn't want anyone making an uninformed decision about following him and then somewhere down the road fall away. And so anytime you and I just look at Christianity through the uh, rose-colored glasses, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Now, with that being said, we're in Luke chapter 14. We'll begin in verse 28, and it says, Jesus, the words are in red. Jesus says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth uh, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost? 
whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest, haply, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but was not able to finish. You see, if we just casually approach Jesus and say, Well, we just say we, we, we say a little prayer uh, 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 to, to, to tell him we want him to be our Savior, and we have no conviction in our heart of our sins, no conviction of a, uh, a, a, of a need for change, no repentance, no intent to let him rule over our life, then that kind of a superficial exchange, that kind of a uh, shallow attachment to Jesus has really no redeeming qualities, has no soul-saving, life-changing qualities to it. And so what happens is, and we've all seen it, I actually experienced it once in my young life. A person will say that they've accepted Jesus and then make an effort to follow Jesus, but then at the first sign of difficulty, the first time things get tough, they throw in the towel, and that's the end of it. I did that as a sophomore in high school. Math teacher was a part-time uh, math teacher, part-time pastor in a little country church and he he he, he did, did, did his job he witnessed to me in class one day and I made that little uh, prayer but there was nothing to it I had no intent of letting Jesus have my life why do we call it quits why does a person that has that shallow attachment to Jesus call it quits because there never was any real concept of him as Lord. There never was, and maybe they saw him as Savior, but there was never any real snapshot, if you will, of him being <coughs> the authority over their lives. You see, when we see Jesus as Lord, we see him as one who has the right to call the shots. We see him as one that has the right to tell us what to do. The one that has the, uh, uh, is in the position to make demands upon us. And we understand that and we're willing to yield to those demands. We're willing to submit to him in a, to, uh, attempt and a desire to have those demands uh, fulfilled or uh, carried out in our life. Now... I said the word attempt. That's what it is because we do fall short many times. And granted, grace covers that and, and mercy uh, deals with that, okay? We, we many times will uh, fall short, but if we have a real commitment, then we stay hooked even when we've fallen short. Maybe it, perhaps when we have this walk with the Lord, then it creates some circumstances that become difficult. Maybe, maybe we're confronted with opposition along the way. Maybe someone be, we begin to draw fire from the critics. If we truly see Jesus as Lord, we'll endure those trials and we'll endure that adversity because we're not... Uh, fair weather followers of Jesus, we won't let the cares of this world choke out the word of God in our life as the parable of the sowers uh, speaks of. Why? Because we've counted the cost. And we're committed. Let's zero in in verse 28 for a moment. It says, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? It says he's intending to build. In other words, he has a vision for this tower. He can imagine this tower standing tall and glorious. You know, you and I have a desire for heaven. It, I don't think anybody in their right mind can envision heaven and not want that for themselves, okay? We want to go there. We would be fools to not want to be there. But just wanting to go to heaven is not enough. Unless we have what it takes to get there, we're going to be very disappointed. 
What does it take? It takes a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to get there. Without the relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we'll never realize our desire to be in heaven. The word there used in verse 28 is sufficient. It simply means to, uh, what it takes. Have what it takes. It's the perfect time to ask this question. Do you have what it takes to get to heaven? If you say yes, I say great. I'm glad you have that, okay? But let's make sure everybody in the room understands what it is that we have to have that's sufficient to carry us to heaven. And it's this, to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, listen to this, the Lord and believe in Thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Remember the word there, Lord. Skip down a couple of verses. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. Remember our snapshot this morning today is of Jesus as Lord. Lord means supreme authority. Master. He whom a person belongs to. Folks, this is huge when you think about it. And it's often missed. People say, I want a Savior, but they have no intent of letting Him be the Lord of their lives. No intent of letting Him uh, call the shots and have authority. They didn't count the cost. And it resulted in the kind of shallow approach to Jesus that will not be sufficient to get them to heaven. No sufficient salvation. So guess what happens? Notice verse 29. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it. In other words, it's not sufficient. All that behold it begin to mock him. You see, people can set out, as again as I did in sophomore year of high school, Set out to live a Christian life. I left there that day. I left school saying, I'm going to turn over a new lip. I'm going to do this, that, and the other right. Well, I didn't make it 24 hours. Okay? So people set out to live the Christian life but can't complete the job. Why? Because they don't have life-changing power. Life-changing authority over their life. They don't have Jesus Christ residing within them or the Holy Spirit, if you will, residing within them in order to complete a Christian life. And don't you know this, that Satan sits back and snickers when he sees that? The verse says here, that uh, verse 29, that uh, behold, uh, they begin to mock him. Being crafty and deceitful, being the enemy that he is, Satan loves to see people running around this earth thinking they are Christians. He loves that. Because if they think they're a Christian, but they have no real life-changing, soul-redeeming connection to Jesus, he knows that they're destined to leave this world for all eternity in hell. You see, the truth is Satan has his own method of advertising Christianity. Like the marketing practices of the world, he has no problem with people seeing the big, bold letters that say Jesus is the way. He don't mind people seeing that. He doesn't care if people recognize that truth. Because just recognizing that truth won't convert anyone. Jesus just doesn't want people to see any specifics. He doesn't want people... to to count the cost, if you will. He doesn't want them uh, to see... The small print. And then follow through with a commitment to Jesus. Because why? That would provide for them sufficient salvation. A salvation that would not only ex- uh, secure eternal life for them, but also provide the power to live a life anew. A, a life that's turned around. Satan definitely wants the lordship of Jesus Christ to be in very, very fine so it'll get overlooked. 
But the Bible puts it all out there. You see, Jesus doesn't do that. The warning labels, it puts with his teaching in big, bold letters, the great things that come with being saved, also in great, big, bold letters are the drawbacks and the cost. Jesus wants it all understood. I want you to, let's back up one verse to verse 27. He says this, he says, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now let's, let's just break that down for just a moment. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It, I think it would be safe for us to say, he's saying, if they don't bear their cross, they're not saved. Simply put, okay? Now, let's talk about bearing the cross. This, this, this verse is, is, is misunderstood often. Here's the meaning of that. When the Romans crucified a person, they would many times have that person carry their own cross to the designated location where the crucifixion was going to take place. And why was that? Why did they do that? They did that because the onlookers, the public, would see the absolute submission of that person to Roman government. In other words, we'll break you. We will make you submit to Roman authority. So that person, even in death, death is yielding to Roman authority. So the whole meaning of this verse here, Jesus is simply saying true discipleship requires submission. Yielding, just as that person carrying the cross has submitted to Roman authority, a person that knows the lordship of Christ and is truly a disciple will submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. If we're followers of Christ, we will recognize his authority, we'll be willing to let him call the shots, we'll be willing to let him uh, 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 tell us how to live our personal lives, how to raise our families, how to function financially, how to work and do our jobs. We'll let him have all of these things. And there's nothing about that that's easy. But if we're willing to do so, folks, that's where the real blessing is. Unfortunately, we often read all the bold print, the benefits on the label, but we do everything we can to avoid the potential difficulties. We want God to prosper us financially in every other way. We want Him to give us strong, healthy relationships. We want Him to uh, have, give us favor on our jobs and in our, 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 our uh, um, um, endeavors. We want peace. We want contentment in our hearts. We want all these things to be afforded us without having any demands made upon our life. And it doesn't work that way. Without having to do the hard stuff. We want all of these things without having to do anything difficult and hard. In my studies this last week, I stumbled onto this verse in Proverbs. Uh, it's actually in the margin between the uh, two columns of scripture here on this page that I'm on. And I just was glad, I don't often even study in that particular way, but I noticed the verse and I looked it up, and it's Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 27. I think they'll get it on the screen for us in just a moment. It says this, and there's a principle here that will be very helpful to you and I today. It says, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thine house. Now, I've probably read that. I mean, I've read Proverbs over and over and over and over for many years, never picked up on this verse or the meaning of it, but because it drew my interest, I went ahead and studied it out. So let me paraphrase this verse for you, and it'll be very safe in, in doing so. It says this, essentially, do the work that is necessary out in the fields, then you can build your own house. Do the work that's necessary out in the field, and then you can build your own house. So here's the picture that this verse paints for us. <coughs> in ancient times, it was an agriculture-driven society, okay? People often owned small parcels of land, and they worked that particular parcel of land 
to make their living for their family, to either provide food and, and clothing through the, uh, the sheep and the, and the crops and, and then to barter with, okay? So let's imagine a young fella comes along and he buys a field, a parcel of ground. He wants to make a life for he and his family, but in his excitement and in his zeal, he immediately begins to build himself a big house to the neglect of the fields. Now, that doesn't seem too bad at first glance. You think, wow, he's, he's going to have a nice house. But without the fruits of the field, without the crops, what's going to fund all of this? What's going to pay the bills? What's going to finish the house? What's going to sustain he and his family? What he didn't realize was that necessities must be met before conveniences can be enjoyed. Without sufficient resources, the whole life on the farm was never going to work out or be fulfilled. In a very real sense, this pictures for you and I a shallow, superficial attempt at Christianity. Sometimes a person thinks, I want a Christian life. Simply enthusiastically, I just, I just want a Christian life. But they don't have any real concept of lordship. No intent to allow Jesus to have full authority over their life. No desire to submit to the hard things. No desire to yield to the things that Jesus expects of them. No plans to take up their cross and follow him. They haven't counted the cost. So, somewhere along the way, usually sooner than later, they fall away from Christ and return to their former life. They cannot continue in what had not yet begun. Christianity has to begin the right way or it will end the wrong way. It must. Seeing that Jesus is not just a Savior, but He is a Lord, is the right way to begin a relationship with Jesus. A soul-saving life-changing, heart-changing salvation that gives us the power to follow through. It gives us the power to get past the tough spots. It gives us the energy, if you will, to carry out the service that He expects from our life, service that is sometimes very demanding because He has the authority over our life He's able to give us the power over our life. If you try to go follow Christ without being truly redeemed, without having the Holy Spirit living within you, like the farmer in his, his house, he, you're trying to build something, but you haven't the resources or the, 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 the substance to see it carried, be, to see it carried out. I want to ask you to stand. If you're here this morning and you feel as though you have never truly had a life-changing experience with Christ, I'm saying something that very real change in your life. I'm not trying to talk you out of being saved. If you're saved and you know it, praise the Lord, okay? But if you look back on your life and you say, you know what, I've always wanted to be a Christian, I always wanted to live a good life, but I've never experienced the Lordship of Christ. I've never had Him rule and reign over my life. If that's you, friend, this morning, same thing happened to me my sophomore year. It never, it never was real, but at the age of 21, it became real. When I bowed and asked Jesus into my heart, and in, in that uh, pastor's office back home at the age of 21, I truly intended right then to let him be the Lord of my life. Not just the Savior, not just fire insurance, so to speak, but the Lord of my life who would call the shots. And folks, since then, 
There's been a lot of demands made upon my life just as it is in any other Christian. But I had the power of the Holy Spirit to help me meet those demands. If God spoke into your heart, if that's you this morning, and you know that you need, really need him to become the Lord and Savior of your life, please come. Come for any other reason you want to bow before this altar for any other particular need. If you need me to pray with you, I'm right here. God spoke into your heart. You come. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody's going to be looking around. Thank you.